Another beautiful day for ranking design patterns. And what I really like about this video series is that it's not only about Node.js, you can literally take these design patterns and apply it to any other programming language. And obviously, if you haven't seen the previous video, go check it out because we're covering these four design patterns that are quite cool and we even have one in Me Gusta section. Quick shout out to Fernando Doglio, the author of this amazing article on Node.js design patterns where I took the ideas from. And with that said, we're gonna start with the very first design pattern called COR. COR stands for the chain of responsibility. All right, let's look at the code and what we're gonna see here is that we have a process request function, all right? We're gonna forget about this for a second. The important part starts here. We have an array of responsibilities, all right? The array is called chain and what it has is basically a bunch of functions. In this case, we have three. So the first function does some operation. In this case, it's gonna check if it's a number, yes, then we're gonna output something. If not, we're gonna return. And we're gonna do the same for a string or an array. And what we do later is we simply call this process request function and give it some kind of a value. For example, we can give it a number, an array or a string, and we pass this chain with responsibilities. So here we are producing something, right? We, we invoke a function and we pass it a chain of responsibilities or functions that are responsible for handling this operation, all right? If you look at the process request function, what it does is basically we receive the chain and then we're gonna loop over the chain and perform every operation. And as soon as we return null, we're gonna stop the process, all right? So only one function from the chain can perform the operation and then the rest are quitted. So what it allows us is basically defining a chain of functions that can be fired, but as soon as one is processed, uh, the operation is done. Now, I'm giving you three seconds to kind of think about where this is actually used in a Node.js web framework called Express, for example. All right, three seconds going, three, two, one. Well, this is basically used in middlewares. Let me uncomment this section. And you're gonna remember that in Node.js, we have middle, uh, sorry, in, in Express.js, we have middlewares. What is a middleware? Maybe if you don't know it. So we can have a client here, all right? The client makes a request to our API, which is built with Express.js and Node.js. So whenever the client makes a request, we can have some kind of a middleware here. The middleware is going to live between the client and the web server. So, or our API rather, we can do in this middleware is a lot of interesting or important stuff because before reaching our API, we can do some logging. Our API controller doesn't have to deal with logging. We can do the logging in the middleware. We can do the authentication in middleware. We can set the headers or check the headers in middleware and so on. So middleware is kind of important in web frameworks. If you're using Spring Boot, maybe it's not called middleware. It can be called a filter if I'm not mistaken. Let me know what it's called in your web framework that you're using. But basically it's performing kind of a function of a middleman or the first layer of processing the request that's coming from the client, all right? And actually you can have more, one or more middlewares. So you can have one or even one more. What's gonna happen is as soon as the first middleware processes the request, it's gonna call next and it's going to forward the request to the next middleware. Then the next middleware is going to forward it to the third middleware and so on. So what we're gonna see here is that we have this app.use. This is basically our middleware function or, or callback. And this one's simply logging something about the request, incoming request, blah, blah, blah. And then we're gonna call next. And then if we have another middleware, like this one, we're gonna, then the second middleware is going to be used. If not, it's going to finally go to the router and then to the controller like this. So you probably know about this, just wanted to remind you that the chain of responsibility is basically what a middleware does. Uh, the only difference here is that the middleware can call next, meaning it can skip to the next middleware function or not. But with the chain of responsibility, as you saw, if we return null, our basically operation breaks and stops rather, not breaks. So 
The middleware is basically a mix of a chain of responsibility pattern and with streams. So both combined into one. All right. So where would I put this one? I think this is quite cool. And as we saw, it's quite, it's, it's kind of used in different frameworks. So I will put it to, I will use it because I really like middlewares. They're very practical. All righty, then we're going to start with the next one, IFE or IIFE, which stands for the immediately invoked function expression. So let's go over the code and take a look. So I know that the old school web developers, and I used to be one of them, and I used to see IFEs a lot with jQuery. This is how you would instantiate uh, jQuery. I think you would put the dollar sign here or, or somewhere else. Uh, to immediately invoke the jQuery as soon as the document is loaded. And people will actually hate this a lot uh, because it's, it's kind of ugly. So what's happening here is that we have a function, <clears throat> but the funny thing is that we are wrapping our function in another function and we are immediately invoking it. So what's going to happen is if I run this function like this, so I'm going to say node iffy, it's going to print uh, 40. And as you can see, I didn't even invoke this function manually. It got invoked as soon as I ran the file itself, because here is the function invocation. Now you can ask like, this is pretty useless, as long as you're not using jQuery within, within your HTML, right? But the answer here is that it's actually used extensively within, for example, TypeScript or many other libraries. So the type, what TypeScript does is actually it's, it transpiles your TypeScript file into a JavaScript file at the end of the day, right? Under the hood, it's basically a transpiler. It takes your TypeScript file and makes kind of a weird JavaScript file. And if you actually look into your, your TypeScript classes, especially with, with classes, what it's gonna do is it's going to wrap them in ifies. Maybe you didn't know that, so this is some kind of new information, um, but it's also going to wrap e your um, static uh, keywords in ifies. Well, you cannot use static in, in a function, but imagine this is a TypeScript class. You can have static properties. It's going to be inside an ify because otherwise it, it pollutes the, the global scope. And the same with private properties. So in, in ES6, if I'm not mistaken, or the older ES5, you were not able to, you, you don't have any private properties within a class and you actually didn't have classes. So what we had to do is return the functions like this and wrap them in an ify and then this would kind of simulate a private property but nowadays you can of course do that and especially with typescript so this is kind of a work around again around the ifies or around private private and static properties now again if you are using babel or typescript this is the ifies are going to be everywhere in your transpiled code all right so it's just good to know that they're er everywhere now, the question is, where would I put it? And I would probably put it in a purgatory because it might die someday. It might die out if all the browsers are able to maybe magically understand TypeScript someday, or I'm predicting there will be some kind of a change like this in the future. So otherwise we don't really need ifies. They're quite useless, all right? So I'm gonna put it in the purgatory. Now, the next pattern is called factory. And also a creational pattern like the prototype, but different. So let's take a look at the code. Let me close the terminal. And what do we have here? So if you watch one of my Node.js error handling videos, if you haven't, go watch it. It's, it's very cool and quite advanced if you want to level up your skills. But what basically we have there is um, the concept of not using the default error object or error class of JavaScript. So for example, let's say you have a controller and you do something and you have a try catch and within the catch, if the error is thrown, you're doing this new error, oops, error, and you're going to put, let's say, database request failed. Just imagine this, all right? And this is actually bad practice because you have to write distinct string in your error message every time. And what if they are not unified? So it's going to be very kind of a smelly code, all right? The better way is basically creating a kind of, kind of a custom error class 
Maybe you don't have to call it custom error, you can call it application error or extended application error, and then extend it from a base error class, and then you can pass it a name. This is a very simplified example, but you can also pass it something like a, uh, you can pass it a message, you can pass it a name, you can pass it a severity. I think this is what we covered. You can pass it some IDs, some uh, correlation IDs and so on to be able to track the errors better within your application. But this factory pattern is uh, based on that. It's based on that, but it also goes one layer further. So imagine we have different types of errors, okay? We have a not found error and we have validation error, okay? And these errors are basically also kind of custom. Now, if you have different types of errors and you want to kind of put them in a, in a new abstraction layer, you can actually use the factory. So we're going to create another class called error factory, and it's going to combine these two errors that we defined before. So it's basically a, a combining class for your other classes. And obviously, these ones are going to uh, extend the custom error as well, as you saw here. That's why they have access to the name, all right? So they're this one is extending the error, and these two guys are extending the custom error so that they have access to the same uh, properties. Okay, so this is basically helping with encapsulation and scalability. Let's say you have another type of error, like let's call it transitive error, and you want to uh, basically create it. What's your, what you're going to do is just the name, and you're simply going to put it as a new case, the switch case, very simple. So the error factory is basically helping us to encapsulate different, uh, different operations or different classes that extend each other in a very simpler, simpler way. So this is very useful, I think. And I will actually put it to, gives me a good dopamine hit. I think it's very common to use the factory pattern for an abstraction, as an abstraction layer for more complex classes. So this is definitely something I would really recommend using you too. All right, then let's go to the next one, which is called dependency injection. And you probably heard this one a lot. Let me quickly tell you what the benefits are. All right, so let's look, take a look at the code. We have a user service, which is having a constructor. And within a user service, we are using this user repository. Now, if you're not familiar with the notation or with the name repository, in some frameworks, it's not used at all. For example, in Node.js, I don't think it's used. Repository is basically a class. <clears throat> it's not a service. It's a class that communicates with your database. All right. So a service is, is let me illustrate that. So a service here is going to call a repository, which is pretty much also a service, but in Node.js development, we usually don't create them. So uh, it's broken. All right. So repository, and then the repository is going to talk to your database. Okay. So we're not directly talking to the database from our service, just to separate the responsibilities. And we have a user repository and it's going to, yeah, as I said, get users to the database, um, from the database, add users to the database. And what we're going, doing later is that we have in, instantiate the user repository like this, and we pass the user repository to the user service as a dependency injection. And this is called dependency injection because we are passing one instantiation of a class into another class. And now what it allows us to do is kind of avoid relying on uh, on other classes from one class directly let me tell you what i mean we could have easily just done this this dot user repository and get users we could have done this but now we have a direct dependency from this class to this class but if we revert this we're relying on the thing that was passed through our constructor and this is much cleaner because User service is telling tell, <clears throat> is gonna work like you pass me something from, through the constructor, and I'm going to rely on on this, and I'm going to rely on the fact that it's going to have the needed properties. For example, it's going to have get users, and that's it. It's basically used a lot within Angular if you used it. 
for example, in your component, if you want to use a service, you're going to inject the service into your class and then component class, and then you're going to call the service. All right. So this is very handy. And as you can see, what we do is we're going to use the service here, a very simple. And the cool thing here is that if we need to change this one to another one, let's say new user repository, for some reason, we have a new one, we're simply going to create a new repository here, like this. And let's call this new user repository and use this one. And what we simply do is replace this one with this one, and it's going to work right away. So how cool is that? I think this is one of my favorite patterns, to be honest. So I'm going to put it to me gusto. I really like it. If you guys like this video, we still have more for, have four more design patterns to cover, but I'm going to do it in the next one. So stay tuned, smash the like button, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. And if you're curious, check out the previous video that I'm going to link in the description. And also the code is going to be on GitHub. So you have a link for that too. Goodbye.